you want to get any of my video materials, they're not copyrighted. God loves you. God loves me. He wants you in his family. If you'll ask him now, he'll come into your heart. And of his family, you'll be part. Folks, somebody's got to reach these young kids. You ought to get some videos or something. My material's not copyrighted. You can use mine any way you want. How many have been to one of my seminars before or have seen one of the tapes before? Uh, not me. Who are you? I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. That's great. I mean, that's not great. That's stupid, but I don't care. Who are you? Kent Hovind. Kent Hovind. That name's really familiar. Where have I heard that before? Jesus Christ, their God, their creator, their savior. Oh. My. God. You're another one of Pendleton's sources? Ugh, if you're anything like Carl Baugh, this is gonna be miserable. But I guess I shouldn't speak so soon, so what do you got to show me today? I'm gonna show you 100 reasons why evolution is so stupid. Ah, you're gonna projectile vomit 100 claims at me. It's like Hello, I'm a Scientist never ended. Anyway, this, this one's one for you, you Kent. Can't. Check it out. You're a button. The word evolution has at least six different meanings, and you've, I've done 58 debates now, and if you're going to get into a debate on evolution with anybody, you better first define what you're talking about. Can we talk about musical evolution? Because I'd much rather talk about the transition from blues and rock and roll to heavy metal than whatever you're going to talk about. Because this is a very slippery term, okay? First we have cosmic evolution. That would be the Big Bang. Let's get this out of the way right now. It's pretty clear that what you're about to do is apply the word evolution to the entirety of the modern scientific understanding of the majority of the history of the universe. Now I'm sure you're using the term to try to confuse your audience by acting as though universal origin theories are somehow linked with the theory of biological diversity. So it's a cheap tactic and I dislike the extremely sloppy language, but for now I'm actually going to let you get away with it. See. Whatever your intentions may actually be, all you've actually done is simply repurpose the word evolution as an umbrella term meaning every accepted scientific theory related to the history of life, the universe, and everything. Of course, not everything within that group is going to be evolutionary in any sense of the word, so you could have chosen the word pasteurization or something instead and it would have been just as relevant. But according to page 10 of the PDF scan of your 1991 dissertation, which unfortunately is the only page reference I can give since the actual document has no page numbers, very professional. You believe that the technical definition of evolution is simply change. Nothing more than that, just the single word change. Which for some reason you apparently take to mean the entire history of the universe. So I don't like it, but fine, whatever, I'll accept it for the purpose of brevity as long as everyone watching understands that the way you're using the term is very different from how it's used in science and that all these very different concepts that you've grouped don't actually form any kind of monolithic concept within science. I want it to be very clear that what you're actually talking about is a collection of many different scientific theories spanning many different scientific fields. Which brings us to my only caveat. If at any point you switch from just using this word as a shorthand for a set of ideas to calling this set of ideas a theory, or otherwise pretending that there's some single scientific theory or field that addresses all of them, I'm going to have to object, because that would make it very clear that what you're trying to do is mislead your audience. Alright? Alright. Now to get to the actual point that you made, since the Big Bang wasn't an evolutionary event in any sense of the word that other people use, using the term cosmic evolution to simply mean the Big Bang is stupid. It's stupider once you consider that what you actually mean is just the Big Bang, and we already have a term for that. The Big Bang. There's literally no reason to create a new term for this except to try to link the Big Bang Theory with the Theory of Evolution. But you've already shown yourself to use very sloppy language, so I'm not too surprised. Then we'd have to have chemical evolution. See, the Big Bang supposedly made hydrogen. And helium, and a little lithium, and beryllium. But I guess that's nitpicking. Well, how did we get 92 elements, plus the synthetic ones? I mean, how did the chemicals evolve? They don't talk about that much, but that would have to happen. Again, there's already a word for that, it's nucleosynthesis, and again, it's not an evolutionary process at all. So now, instead of cosmic evolution and chemical evolution, we now have the precisely equivalent Big Bang and nucleosynthesis. 
These are much more accurate terms for these distinctly non-evolutionary events and processes. I just helped you out, by the way, because the term chemical evolution usually relates to the origin of complex organic molecules, not nucleosynthesis. Thirdly, we'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. But you know the stars would have to evolve. There's an awful lot of stars out there, folks, but nobody's ever seen one form. There are stars forming all over the place, you can see them. Maybe you should have actually checked your facts before you made that declaration. But I guess that would have been just a little bit inconvenient to your argument, wouldn't it? And yet again, your language is really sloppy. Stellar evolution refers to the changes that occur throughout the entire lifetime of a star. The term you should have used is star formation. And the term planetary evolution has the exact same problem, so you should have used the term planet formation. There's enough stars out there that everybody on Earth can personally own two trillion of them. <laughs> this is a bit off topic, but it kind of makes me sad that your audience laughed at that because it seems to indicate that they either don't know that there are lots and lots of stars, or they did know it, but for some reason they thought you told a joke when in fact you only made a roughly accurate statement about reality. We've never seen one star forming. We see them blow up from time to time, it's called a nova or a supernova, we've never seen one form. One professor told me one time, he said, well, we calculated in the laboratory that if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll produce enough energy to make a brand new star. I said, well, that's brilliant. You've got to lose 20 to gain one. You ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt. <laughs> one professor of astronomy, I would hope, told you one time, I guess in line at the DMV or something, that they calculate in the lab that if 20 stars explode right next to each other, they could produce enough energy to produce a new star. Now, even the way you tell it, he didn't come close to saying that the only way new stars are ever produced is for 20 other stars to explode near each other, which is good, since we can see new stars forming right now, and that's not how it's happening. And oddly, on your slide showing the relatively mundane fact about how many stars are in the universe, you bothered to cite a source, even if that source was astronomy and the Bible, but you didn't cite any source for this much more outrageous claim, so I can only assume that you couldn't find a source that says that the only way stars are ever formed is the explosion of 20 stars in close proximity. And yet, despite that incredibly obvious flaw in the premise of your joke that renders it entirely unfunny, your audience still laughed. This isn't even about whether you're a creationist or not, it's about basic joke structure. For a joke with a setup and a punchline to be funny, we have to have enough information in the setup that the punchline makes sense. In this case, your joke could have been funny if you had said that he said that the only way stars ever form is by 20 stars exploding near each other. You needed to provide that extra piece of information that would exclude the other possibilities which are what draw your punchline into question. It's somewhat like a logical argument. We have to be able to tell that your conclusion or punchline follows from your premises or setup. You know, come to think of it, your failure to grasp that concept would neatly unify the explanations for your awful comedy and your awful logic. First place, that's all theoretical. We've never seen it happen, okay? You're right. I'm pretty damn sure that we've never seen it happening, which would be why it's not an accepted explanation for star formation. And I think it is scientifically impossible. Scientifically impossible? Now that's quite the scientific claim, and yet it sounds like it's based on nothing more than a hunch. You and I both think it's highly improbable, but you're also asserting that it's impossible, which you actually need to demonstrate. So what research concludes that it's impossible? I'm gonna go ahead and say that no research does, since that's not how science works, and further, that you think it's impossible for the same reason you think evolution is impossible. That is, no good reason. See, then we'd have to have organic evolution. That would be the origin of life. How did life get started from non-living material? Yet again, there's already a word for that, which is abiogenesis. Now, according to the evolution theory, that would have to happen somewhere along the line, long ago and far away. Life had to come from non-living material. I see. According to the evolution theory. Well, Kent, I could interpret that to mean that you broke my rule against conflation, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that you use the phrase the evolution theory specifically to distinguish it from your umbrella term of evolution. But in that case, this statement... Life had to come from non-living material. ...isn't quite right. While it's certainly true that life had to originate somehow before evolution could take place, how that occurred is irrelevant to the theory of evolution. You could replace abiogenesis with instantaneous divine creation of the first life form from nothing, and the theory of evolution wouldn't be affected in the least. You're confusing the theory of evolution with abiogenesis, which does address the question of life originating from non-living material. Fifthly, we would have macroevolution. That is where an animal changes into a different kind of animal. 
Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Even though I just met you, somehow, deep down, I feel like I know you, Kent. Specifically, I know that you think so-called microevolution, or variation, occurs. I know you think that what you call dog kind has common descent. Chihuahuas descended from wolves, for example. And I know that you know that nobody has ever seen a wolf give birth to a non-wolf. You don't get to demand that for evidence of macroevolution you see a dog give birth to a non-dog if you're not going to also demand that for microevolution you see a wolf give birth to a non-wolf. Why the weird double standard? Don't answer that, it's obviously a rhetorical question. But the evolutionist believes a dog came from a rock. If you go back far enough in time, 4.6 billion years. The evolutionist believes that. Which one? Because I want to give him a smack. Look, is this a list of a hundred stupid things about evolution, or is this a list of a hundred stupid things about that idiot's understanding of it? Finally, we have microevolution. I don't like this word, okay, because it gets people confused. I think we ought to just call it a variation. But microevolution happens, folks. That is a fact of science. Animals produce a variety of offspring, but it's always the same kind. Same thing with so-called macroevolution, it just goes on for longer. No dog has ever given birth to a non-dog, and yet change occurs. Just like a wolf has never given birth to a non-wolf, and yet change occurs. This distinction you have between micro and macro evolution only exists in your imagination. They're the exact same process with the exact same mechanisms, and there's no mechanism creating a separation between them, which is the only way they could be distinct from each other. The first five definitions of evolution are stupid. I agree, those are all stupid definitions. And if you think your own definitions are stupid, I have no idea why you use them. Every single one is pointless and redundant. Cosmic evolution is a redundant label for the Big Bang, chemical evolution is a redundant label for nucleosynthesis, and the term already has an entirely different meaning. Stellar and planetary evolution don't mean what you think they mean, and you should have used star and planet formation. Organic evolution is just a redundant label for abiogenesis, and macro and microevolution are just redundant terms for biological evolution. There seems to be no point to this mislabeling other than to confuse people so the waters are muddied in scientific discussions. Which I guess is a smart tactic when you're defending a position that collapses under the weight of the tiniest amount of scientific literacy. It doesn't happen. It's certainly not part of science. It's something you have to believe in. What do you mean they're not part of science? You think they're wrong? Well, that doesn't mean they're not part of science. All those ideas are based on scientific research, so what the hell else would they be part of? Track and field? And regarding how you just used the word believe, you seem to think that believe means the same thing as believe on faith. You know the words on faith aren't in that phrase just to sound pretty, right? The word belief just means acceptance of a claim is true, and it doesn't inherently say anything about the reasons for accepting the claim, or the level of certainty. So, whatever implication you were trying to make there failed miserably. They teach the kids it all started with a Big Bang 20 billion years ago. Eh, uh, nope. A Big Bang. I like to ask him some simple questions. Uh, what exploded? Your mathematical models of the early universe confuse me. You'll need to tell me what it actually was. Now, since it's called the Big Bang, which clearly totally defines the entire theory without me having to look any deeper at what it actually says, that means that it was an explosion. And the things that explode are TNT and C4. Now, which one was it? And where did it come from? And where did the energy come from? Etc, etc. That's a perfectly legitimate question, but what you're doing is denying the observed effect because you don't know the cause. That's asinine. You wouldn't deny that you see a car in the ditch just because you don't know why it ran off the road. Or to use a better analogy, what you're doing is looking at a car in the ditch and saying it ran off the road one minute ago even though you've been standing there looking at it for two minutes, the engine's totally cold, nobody's inside, and it's covered in six feet of snow, and then you're justifying that position by saying, hey, you don't know why it ran off the road. That's stupid. According to the Big Bang Theory, it all started with a little tiny dot and exploded. <laughs> and spread out over all the universe much faster than the speed of light. The universe expands faster than the speed of light. Space-time itself. You said that something exploded and spread out inside the universe, which implies something material traveling through space faster than the speed of light, which is just... wrong. You would think that the fact that you thought you had physicists of all people saying something like that would have caused you to pause and think maybe you didn't quite understand what they meant. The Big Bang idea th started with a Belgian astronomer named George something, can't pronounce his last name, George said that this original matter was no more than a few light years in diameter. At the very least, that would be two, or about 12 trillion miles. 
No, actually, it wouldn't. You said it yourself. No more than a few light years. No lower bound is stated or implied. In fact, you're claiming a meaning for those words that's exactly the opposite of what they actually say. Nobody is that sloppy with their language unless they have a reason. So let's find out what that reason is. So they started off teaching at a spot 12 trillion miles across was what exploded. Well, they revised that down. In 1965, they said, no, it was only 275 million miles across. Well, that's way down from 12 trillion. 1972, they said, no, it's only 71 million miles across. I don't know how they know this stuff, but this is what they taught, okay? 1974, they said it was only 54,000 miles across. 1983, they said it was the trillionth the diameter of a proton. Your audience just laughed because something was unintuitive to them. You sure do draw the intellectual elite there, Kent. So anyway, that was your reason for so obviously twisting around the wording of Asimov's report of Lemaitre's opinion? It was just so you could fit it into your narrative of progression in the scientific consensus from a larger original diameter to a smaller one? I don't get why you thought that would help your case when it actually hurts it. Now, I haven't looked into where you got those numbers, but I'll just assume that you're reporting them honestly. They sound okay. When I look at them, what I see is a good illustration of how science should work. As more and better data are gathered, the numbers revise continuously, and since every change is made to fit with the improved data, the number constantly becomes more accurate. It really puzzles me what the problem's supposed to be, since this seems like the inevitable result of real, actual scientific research. What do you think would be better? For the scientifically accepted number to vary wildly up and down with no apparent general trend in the change? Unless there was some really good reason, that would seem pretty questionable. It'd be too random, it wouldn't seem to be improving in precision at all. But what you showed was perfectly reasonable. It shows a gradual improvement in precision. Or maybe you don't like the idea that science doesn't accept the first answer it gets as absolute fact and refuse to improve it for the rest of time. But that's not what science does. That's what religion does. Now they're saying it's nothing at all. Nothing exploded. And here we are. You want to talk about something coming from nothing, take a look at that statement you just made. I understand that the singularity, the infinitely small point indicated by the math, can be confused with nothing, but you neglect the corresponding infinite density. In what universe is an infinitely dense thing the same as nothing? Despite William Lane Craig's incredibly sloppy argument that he thinks infinite density is impossible, therefore nothing can have infinite density, and therefore infinite density and nothing are the exact same thing, not in this universe, nor before this universe. But you know, I really should point out that when I say that, I'm acting as though the singularity is meant to be taken as a physical thing, when really it's more of a concept. It's just a result that comes from the equations that are used to calculate the expansion of the universe. The actual singularity is just the point where these equations break down and show these weird infinite values. It's not necessarily meant to represent some real, actual physical thing. It's often taken as more of an indicator that the theory is incomplete and needs more work. In the case of the Big Bang Theory specifically, it relies on general relativity, which isn't yet unified with quantum physics, which means that it's expected that it'll break down prior to the Planck time. The theory is incomplete, there's more work to do. Of course, either way, the correct response to encountering a mathematical curiosity like that is to say, ooh, that's weird, I wonder what that's all about. I guess we better get to work figuring that one out. And the completely wrong response is, ooh, that's weird, I wonder what that's all about. I guess, uh, there's a supernatural universe-creating person and he did it. Yeah, that'll do it. Hey everybody, we're done here. Let's pack up and go home. This is what the textbooks teach. 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. You said the textbooks teach that nothing at all exploded, and to illustrate that point, you went to a textbook that said the matter was compressed smaller than a period, which in no way supports your claim. One thing I will say, though, is that whoever wrote that textbook shouldn't have called the Big Bang an explosion, since it wasn't one. That's... stupid. <laughs> the word you're looking for is unintuitive. I'm not sure you quite understand the difference between these words. Even if the Big Bang Theory is disproven in the future, the idea wasn't stupid because it explained all the facts that were available before the discovery of the fact that falsified it. The theory that accounts for all the observed facts with the fewest assumptions is the best one possible, even if it's eventually proven wrong, because the only other option would be to just make things up based on nothing. And making things up based on nothing is stupid. Even if it's eventually shown to be correct, because before the evidence is available, there's no way to distinguish a correct made-up answer from an incorrect one, and the only reason it was correct was by fluke. 
An idea is stupid if it's based on stupid reasoning, such as, I read it in an old book, or it's just common sense. Something isn't stupid just because it sounds strange to a layman like yourself. What you're actually doing is evaluating the claim based on intuition. And intuition is what tells you things like, Maggots appear on meat by spontaneous generation. Without air resistance, a heavier object will fall faster than a lighter object. The speed of travel does not affect the relative passage of time. And all descendants of an organism will be morphologically similar forever. A person from 10,000 years ago, and yes Kent, there were people 10,000 years ago, would call you stupid if you told them things that are common knowledge today because the real answers are unintuitive. Luckily, we as a species have developed the tool to remove intuition from the equation and systematically bring ourselves closer to real answers instead. That tool, of course, is the scientific method, and it's the reason that we don't accept those extremely wrong yet completely intuitive answers in modern times. We look carefully at reality in extreme detail with open minds and we find unintuitive answers that are actually true and useful. Or at least are very likely true because they fit with and explain our observations of reality thus far, and predictions made based on those theories are consistently successful. Unfortunately, Mr. Hovind, you seem to be of the belief that your intuition is valid as evidence against a scientific claim, which in itself is valid evidence against the claim that you know anything about science. This one says, all of the matter and energy someday will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then, another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. Way to twist their words to make it seem like they're saying that's a fact. What they're doing is summarizing the concept of a closed universe. I'm assuming they proceeded to do the same with an open universe and a flat universe. Wouldn't make much sense otherwise. This would be a summary of the different possibilities for the ultimate fate of the universe. So you can forget about global warming. <laughs> we're we're going to get squished. What the hell does a short-term problem like global warming have to do with a long-term problem like the collapse of a closed universe? And according to your 2013 dissertation, you believe the rapture will happen in 2028, so why would you care about either of them? Now this textbook author was brilliant. I could not believe how smart this guy was. <clears throat> he said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. <laughs> you have to be at least that smart to write a book. Oh, come on. The next sentence ruins your joke. If you read it, you'll see that the clarification is to explain that nothing doesn't mean empty space, but no space-time at all. To say nothing really means nothing is something of an overly broad statement in the purest physical sense, but clarifying what's meant by nothing was still a good idea. Still, I have some bigger issues with that paragraph. Maybe at the time it wasn't so bad, I don't know. I mean, it's really outdated since it's from 1989, and it's also really low level, so it's very dumbed down. Whatever the reason, it definitely isn't relevant today or even when you gave your speech. The main things are, saying the Big Bang was an explosion is so misleading and confusing for people, it should just never be said. And that age of 16.5 billion years is way, way more than the modern estimate. Maybe there was some estimate in the 80s that put it at that, but that's definitely not correct anymore. By the way, since I know that image is really fuzzy, the book is General Science from 1989, published by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. He said not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. Yeah, see, like I said, very next sentence ruins your joke. When most people say nothing, a lack of space-time is definitely not what they mean, so the clarification was important. It seems like what you're really trying to say is, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I like my information about the universe as vague as possible. However, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? What? That's unintuitive, so obviously I'm not going to bother to actually look at the reasons why cosmologists might think that. If I can't understand it after having done no research whatsoever, it's stupid. Yes, boys and girls, you see, nothing exploded and uh, here we are. <laughs> now, who, who can argue with logic like that? Man. Pretty much everybody, but fortunately that's just your superficial understanding of some shoddily written text in an ancient low-level textbook and not the actual logic, so we're all right. They even put this in major science journals like Scientific American. Scientific American is not a scientific journal. It's a popular science magazine. Don't you claim to have been a science teacher? How do you not know the difference? This fellow said, uh, the observable universe, uh, that would be us, could have evolved, there's that word again, you gotta watch that one, okay, six meanings, <clears throat> from an infinitesimal region. In the Greek, that means a uh, dot. 
It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. They call that science and put it in a science book. I would call that stupid and put it in the garbage. <laughs> Scientific American is not a science book, it's a popular science magazine. But anyway, unlike most quote mines, this one isn't taken completely out of the spirit of the article it was taken from. The reason I call this a quote mine is because it was presented as though it was stated in the article with no previous justification, and as though the word speculate meant something more than it really does. It can sound a little strange on its own like that, certainly, but it's preceded by a great deal of explanation which should clarify what they mean somewhat, although it's still likely to be confusing for most casual non-physicist readers who don't understand how weird things really are at the quantum level. And by the way, I'm one of them, so probably if people want to find out about that kind of stuff they should go listen to Lawrence Krauss or something. I realize that I don't even know enough about it to really firmly accept it or reject it. I'm also really not that personally invested in the answer. I'm perfectly happy to say I don't know, most days I'm perfectly happy to say I don't care, and I'll leave it to the people with a properly deep knowledge of this stuff to figure it out as best they can. But this does present us with an opportunity to talk a little bit again about how actual, real, non-creationist science works. The main thing I want to note about the way you presented that quote, Kent, is that the line only indicates that Guth and Steinhardt find it tempting to speculate, not to declare. That just means they'll consider the possibility their data has led them to and do more work to see if it holds up under scrutiny. With any scientific work, whether the end result shows that they're right or wrong isn't really the point. The point is more that when the data presents possibilities to you, you consider them with an open mind, no matter how unintuitive they may seem, and actually try to figure out if they're right or wrong. That's how knowledge progresses. It's the only way knowledge progresses. Yes, some of the theories that you come up with to explain the data that you're observing are definitely going to be strange when it comes to the origin of the universe. That's just how it is, there's no way around it. These concepts are really unintuitive. The human brain has not evolved in an environment that required it to be able to comprehend things like this. But one way or another, you have to come up with a theory that accounts for all your observations. I can fully understand if someone is very confused and highly skeptical about these cosmological theories. But if you're curious about the answers to these questions, but you're not curious enough to bother to spend the time to actually figure out why these theories exist and what the justification is for them, if your response is just going to be, I find that unintuitive, therefore it's wrong no matter what evidence you have, then you're not thinking scientifically. It seems like, in your constricted little Bible world, scientific inquiry should be limited to only that which you personally find intuitive. You'd prefer that after the discovery of an unintuitive possibility, the work was immediately declared stupid and put in the garbage, instead of continuing forward to see if more could be learned. It seems to me that we as a species have already tried that strategy, over and over and over throughout pretty much our entire history. And look at the result, it did nothing but hold us back. There's a reason that the last 200 years have seen more advancement in human knowledge than any other time in history. Now we try to actually figure things out with an open mind instead of quitting and making up a god every time we come across something we don't quite understand. In other words, I call you stupid and put you in the garbage. This is what the books teach. I collect them. I've got hundreds and hundreds of these books from countries all over the world, clear back from 1890s up until 2001 textbooks. They, they're teaching this kind of stuff, folks. What does Scientific American have to do with your collection of textbooks? Popular Science Magazine. Continues in part two.
organic evolution is just a redundant label for abiogenesis, and macro and microevolution are just redundant terms for biological Fuck evolution. you! But you said that something exploded and spread out inside the universe, which implies something material oh. traveling through space faster than which implies something material traveling through space faster than the speed of light, which is just wrong. You would think that the fact that you thought you had physicists of all Fuck you!